everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present uh, Owned by Statistics, uh, a way of looking at how to make your ML machine learning pipelines more secure using Kubeflow and ML Ops. Uh, this is unbelievably weird. Uh, I've spoken at KubeCon many times, uh, and this is by far the most surreal experience um, that, that you're on the other side watching this on a video, uh, but I'm really excited to talk about this today. So at Microsoft, we've, we've talked about machine learning for a long time. And we're really excited about the opportunity to you know, help the entire industry move forward when it comes to machine learning. Uh, you can see some of the big research breakthroughs that we've done in the past few years. Of course, we all give this back to open source. Uh, but you can see this is really where machine learning um, uh, has, um, uh, you can see where machine learning has really um, uh, changed the way that people are uh, doing things. Um, where uh, you are able to uh, really transform the way that um, machine learning um, and you approach different problems. Um, uh, here you can see already that, that you're seeing better than human performance in a bunch of different areas. And we've given this all back to the community. Uh, not only that, of course, we use it throughout all our products. Uh, just about every product at Microsoft uses machine learning in some way, uh, from commercial to enterprise and so on. Uh, and we're really excited when we talk about these things that, you know, now you can build an entire slide deck just using, you know, verbal commands. Um, that's the, those are the kind of things that machine learning unlocks that would just not be possible without, um, uh, you know, those kind of technologies. Unfortunately, when you think about the average person uh, or average enterprise looking at machine learning, you see things like this. And, and one of the biggest reasons for it is what you see here where um, uh, you know, there's so much focus on the next big model. A GPT-3 uh, comes out and everyone talks about how this is completely groundbreaking. Um, but when you go and look at what it actually takes to build something like that, it's a very complicated pipeline like this. Now you're saying, well, I'm a data scientist. I don't really care about that. Um, all I do wanna care about is building a model. Uh, but the fact is you do care about it. And the reason you care about it is things like this. You can go and build the best model in the world and, and use it, and it's you know, better than human performance across the board. But when it comes to rolling that out to production, uh, that's where you get into big issues. And so that's where the practice of something like MLOps comes up, uh, where you, have a, um, uh, you, you bring people into the overall process of machine learning on one side, uh, and you allow those data scientists to do a whole bunch of activity there at the beginning, um, uh, iterating very, very quickly around their overall loop. But then when it comes to actually rolling it out, they're able to bring it into your standard GitOps pipeline where you're doing development and operations and things like that. Now you're saying, wasn't this supposed to be a talk about security and the ways that machine learning models are better? Um, there, uh, it absolutely was. Uh, because MLOps is the baseline for security. Now you're saying, well, it's just math. How bad could it be? We're going to talk about three different types of attacks today, uh, most of which, if you're using machine learning, are already um, uh, you know, on your mind. Um, and those three attacks are how you know, your attacker gets your ML to lie to you in some way. Second, uh, your attacker takes your models. Um, and then third, your attacker finds out about hidden data. So let's talk about these. First, your attacker gets your ML model to lie to you. Um, we're gonna go through this with um, uh, a very quick thing, and I apologize. Um, let's say you've built a machine learning pipeline that looks something like this. Uh, first, you start with ingesting your data. Second, you talk about engineering and splitting your data. That's where you take your data and you split it into uh, your training and your test sets and so on. Um, then you're gonna bring that together for your overall training experience. Uh, and then finally you serve. Now this is a very, very simple platform. I'm gonna build a very complicated model here called a circle detector. Uh, and so the first thing I'm gonna go do is collect a whole bunch of circles and put that into my training and test data and so on. Uh, and then I take a picture of a circle and I present it to my model and I say, well, did it work? And the answer is yes, of course it did. Look, it's a, it's a circle, obviously. But then I take it and I present another picture 
Uh, and in this case, I present a square. And you're like, well, obviously that's going to fail, but it still says it's a circle. And you're like, well, what is going on there? Um, this one's blue and, and round, and this one over here is square. It's got right angles. What's going on? Well, it turns out that the problem is that inside that square, you have all the pixels that represents a circle. And so your machine learning model says, this is good enough. I, I know what I'm looking for and it works. And the problem here is that I didn't do enough presentation of both good examples of machine learning models and bad examples. The two are obviously different and I need to explain to the machine learning model how things work. So then I might say, well, you know, Surely advanced models are better. Um, this is a phenomenal paper. And by the way, um, all the papers that you see here are going to be listed at the end. Uh, so don't feel like you have to write them all down at once. But in this case, uh, they do this in analysis. Here you have wolves versus huskies. And the model came out really well. Uh, only one mistake. Um, but then when you actually begin to look at it and use some of the great tools out there, I believe this was Lime, to explore exactly what's going wrong, um, it turns out that the things that, uh, the pixels that made the difference for Huskies, uh, you can see there that it looks pretty close to the actual uh, dog itself. But when you look at the things that were predicted as wolves, um, the pixels that uh, look like wolves are actually totally excluded. They weren't important at all. So what happened here is um, it looks like it's actually just a snow detector. Most of those pictures ended up being on snow. And so if there was snow detected in the picture, the machine learning model detected that and said it was a wolf. Now you're like, well, okay, how bad could that be? Here you have where things start to get adversarial. Again, another paper. Uh, on the left-hand side, you take a stop sign and you apply stickers on it. Uh, and it tells the machine learning model that it's a speed limit sign. So now a car wouldn't even stop when it got there. Uh, on the right-hand side, you get to a turtle and uh, you're able to 3D print a shell on top of it and it says it's a rifle. Now you're saying again, who cares? Uh, so you're able to fool a model. Well, when you start to depend on models very deeply, that's where things get really bad. And so here, for example, Amazon's face recognition system uh, went through and detected um, against members of Congress and found that 28 of them matched mugshots. Um, and, and even if you wanted to opt out of these things, you can't. And, and again, at airports and things like that, they're starting to implement these as the first line of defense. So are you terrified yet? Um, what you need to do in your machine learning model to defend against those adversaries is use something like Kubeflow and MLOps to build a rich pipeline and test at every possible place you can. Uh, you add more edge cases, as you can see there, or look for detecting bad data. Uh, you build better evaluation metrics. It's not just enough to say that this was detected as a circle. It's also important to say this was detected as not a circle. This square was detected as not a circle and fold in additional models. Uh, you should always be attacking your own models first. I cannot stress enough. You having a red team as part of your ML ops team or your ML team is critical uh, and building a lot of alerting and monitoring. And then finally, taking all that data and folding it back and moving it into production, or excuse me, moving it into your overall um, uh, training set and is incredibly important, continually training on those kind of things. So how do you do that? You build an MLOps pipeline. And building a pipeline is pretty straightforward. You use a lot of the CICD systems that you already have today, something like GitHub Actions, Jenkins, and so on. There are many, many of them. You add modular components as it makes sense based on the criteria of your model. There's a lot of different tools out there for pulling on these things. And we have some pre-built ones for you at mlops-github.com. And third, just measure, 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 and continually update. I cannot stress enough, static models don't last. And we're gonna show how this gets um, uh, much worse in, in just a little bit. So a standard pipeline that you might build looks something like this. You start over here with your IDE. In this case, maybe you're starting with Visual Studio Code. Uh, you check that into uh, your source repository system, in this case, GitHub. Uh, and then that'll kick off your CI CD system. And inside your CI CD system, you're going to set up things where there are certain elements that execute on the CI CD system itself. In this case, something like um, uh, processing your data. That might be something trivial, like just copying between buckets. Uh, but then you might have larger jobs that execute externally. And so in this case, maybe you're going to execute against Spark uh, to do your feature engineering. When that's done, it calls back into the CI CD system and alerts that it's done. 
You do the same thing. In this case, we're going to train using Kubeflow and Kubeflow pipelines. You train, you finalize those, those jobs, and you call back in. Uh, then you package, and that just might be putting it into a container, you know, attaching Flask, whatever it might be, including the production libraries. And then you roll it out for service, uh, in this case, on something like Azure Machine Learning. So all of that together shows you how to build a complex system where each one of those components is quite modular, and you're able to swap in whatever you like. Um, now, one of the most important things is storing the metadata about each of these steps, every input, execution, and output uh, that's involved. You want to do that in an immutable store, and there are obviously hundreds of those out there that you can use. To swap something else in, then, because you've built this in this very modular way, and let's say I want to swap in an explainer, it's very trivial. You just say, oh, you know, between training and packaging, I want to drop in this explainer, explainers of service or explainer library, whatever makes sense. You call it out, and then it calls back into the packaging step once it's passed. So again, quite sophisticated, but nothing so complicated that you wouldn't be able to pick it up and, and, and piece it together yourself. So that's getting your model to lie to you, and I, you know, I hope I've shown the, the uh, ML ops is critical to that. Um, let's talk about another attack vector uh, where an attacker is able to steal your models. So in this case, um, uh, you know, malicious users are constantly going to be trying to take your models. Uh, uh, most of the uh, most sophisticated models required many, many millions of dollars to train, hundreds and thousands of uh, core hours and GPU hours and things like that. Um, I think the, the figure that I saw recently for GPT-3 was about $4.6 million to train. So really non-trivial stuff. And that's for just large models. Let's say you have something that's particularly proprietary, industry specific. You're really going to need to be uh, uh, understand exactly what's going on. Um, what we're going to talk about today is two types of attacks. One is called a distillation attack, and you can see the paper there. And the second is called a model extraction attack. Uh, the distillation attack is a more generic one, and I'll show you how it works. And then the model extraction attack is, is more specific, but it's in some of the most valuable models, specifically around some of the language stuff. So for a distillation attack, what you're looking at is something like this. You start and you say, well, you know, here's a black box model. I don't know what's inside it. I'm just going to start probing it using these samples. So first I start and I get a response, this heart, and it says, no, I detect nothing in it. Uh, then I get something, it's a Pentagon, and I say, yes, there's something inside that. And then I present it with a whole bunch of examples. And I get a whole bunch of responses. And then I present it with even more examples. And I start to really formulate what is inside that model. And I start building out exactly what's going on. Uh, anyone want to guess what the model is uh, trying to detect here? It's trying to detect Nina Simone, obviously. Uh, no, it is, in fact, trying to detect a triangle. And once I'm able to do that, once I'm able to probe it enough to get the answers, I'm able to pull out and duplicate that original model. Um, and now all of those people can come and uh, use my duplicated model uh, instead of the original. Now, there are a lot of other vectors here, not just for usage, right? I could use it for more sophisticated attacks. I could use it to try and reverse engineer the data that went in uh, to train the model. There are lots of other things involved here. Um, but it's, a, it, you know, it, it's almost impossible to defend against something like this. Now, the question is, how accurate is that duplicated model? Well, it turns out that you're able to get accuracy really quickly. Uh, in this case, uh, to reverse engineer uh, Amazon's logistic regression uh, model uh, for looking at either digits or adults, it was less than 1,500. And for Big ML's decision tree, uh, I was able to get it in under, um, under 4,000. Uh, that's roughly speaking, um, you know, about two a minute for two days. Uh, that's almost impossible to detect from noise. Now, that's just for the distillation model. Um, but for more sophisticated models, something uh, especially around language models, uh, you might use an attack vector like this. So uh, one of the biggest uh, advancements in machine learning models recently uh, came from Google um, uh, around the, their BERT uh, transformers. And the BERT really kicked off an entire new spread of machine learning models and understanding, especially in, in language. Um, these are the Azure Cognitive Services, and we use derivations of some of that original research. Uh, ours have done uh, additional training and other things like that, but the uh, core logic that, that started all this uh, comes from the same. And, and the way you are able to attack this is first by understanding how the model works. So what happens is, is you uh, train on a corpus of information, 
And in that corporate sim information, you start asking questions. And you say, how many instruments did Prince play? You say 27. And it's able to detect that out of this large body of um, Wikipedia information here. Now, the way it's able to do that is by looking through and uh, teasing apart all the sentences and figuring out like what a good response is. And so it does involve a lot of training data and things like that up front. But once that work is done, uh, all the information is in the model itself. And so you're able to probe in a completely different way. In this case, you're able to probe in one of two different ways. One is you just attack it with random information. So in this case, I say, um, uh, I just spit a random set of words against it. How workforce, stop, who knew of Jordan at Wood displayed the, uh, obviously a meaningless sentence, but the model doesn't understand that. It's gonna do its best to respond. And in this case, it says his singing abilities encompassed a wide range, which came from the original corpus of data. And so, uh, you're able to start saying, well, geez, you know, if I say this word over here, then it's able to present that word over, or this sentence over there. Or if I know what the original corpus of data is, in this case, maybe something like Wikipedia, I could just grab a random bag of words from that and apply it to the original. And in this case, you're able to do it and still get a response, even though that sentence is meaningless. But because it came from that original corpus of data, I'm able to do it much more quickly. And to show you exactly how quickly it is, it's something like this. Here you can see um, that in order for me to replicate the original model against the, uh, the original performance, I'm able to get to 72% accuracy. The original model had 84% accuracy with just one-tenth the total number of original queries. Uh, and if I do one time the original amount of queries, I'm able to get to 86%. And I continue to, uh, I'm continue, able to continue to pursue that here you know, I get all the way up to 10x, meaning like I, I probe it 10 times as many times as the original model was, I'm able to get to 90%, almost a, exactly the same level of accuracy. Obviously, this isn't great because I'm able to do that incredibly cheaply. We talked about $4.6 million before. Here I'm able to replicate um, all the models that you see here at, uh, at a high level of accuracy for under two grand. Um, and, and what this really is all about is, is this middle point that you see here. You can try and defend against it, but the value is in the model, or excuse me, in the pipeline, not the model. <clears throat> you want to do continuous retraining. You want to do continuous uh, improvements around your domain, fine tuning, faster throughput, because your data will always be changing. Spending your time focusing on how to defend against it is probably not going to work. What really is not going to be defended against is your ability to process data and process training quickly. And so, you know, in shorthand, Spend the majority of your ta engineering time on that left-hand side, using tools like GitHub Actions, like Kubeflow pipelines, like so on, building really efficient pipelines for this, rather than on the right-hand side. Again, you don't want to throw open the doors. You want to make it at least trivially hard to take. But spending a lot of time on that right-hand side will be, will, will be unfortunately, a fool's errand. So that's, that's a, a, when the attackers are able to attack, take your models. Now let's find out about hidden data. So um, uh, hidden data is a problem you're probably already having. Uh, we talk about data leakage all the time. Uh, in this case, what a malicious user wants to do is find out about the data you trained on. So they're gonna probe your model and detect uh, in understanding about individuals behind the scenes. So hidden data, uh, data leakage is an example. These already happen today. You know, let's say I'm in recommendations um, and, you know, it's it's saying where I should potentially go for my next, um, you know, meeting. In this case, you know, maybe it's revealing something about historical events um, that it was able to detect. Uh, maybe it's able to look through my network graph. In this case, uh, I don't follow these people. My friends do. Um, and again, this might not be public data necessarily, or excuse me, it might not be private data necessarily, but it's certainly not surfaced in a way that, that is as easily consumable as this. Uh, or, you know, maybe I'm, you know, going out for a run and I pop up in my mapping app and it say, you know, where should I go for a run? Uh, and in this case, it's revealing uh, where the community runs in the area. And then fortunately that gives the community an entire map of, uh, you know, private buildings. Again, these are very common data leakage things, certainly not the only ones and certainly not restricted to ML, but, uh, there's nothing so bad that it can't be made worse, uh, especially when it comes to ML. So here we are in, um, uh, you know, uh, every presentation needs an XKCD um, as an example. And in this case, you know, I'm in Gmail 
and I'm able to probe against the suggestion endpoint. And so it starts by saying, uh, let the ruling classes, and it fills in the rest of the information for me. And that's a, this is obviously something that is really fun and exciting and useful to me. But if an attacker is able to get access to that, uh, they're now able to probe against my private corpus of information. And that is my private emails and my private correspondence and private documents that I've written. Uh, now, again, those, that's just one suggestion. It can get much, much worse. You know, in, in each of these cases, maybe I'm just presenting on the left-hand side. I say my shipping address, and then the, the suggestion fills in the right, or I'm calling it. Uh, and then it gets really bad down here, where you start talking about things like credit cards and social security numbers, where I'm able to present just the first part of a social security or a credit card or social security number, which are public information. Uh, 4128 is a known starter for Visa. Uh, 262 is the starter for any social security number for someone born in Florida. It actually comes from a small range of like 261 to 267, but you get the idea. That, that public information, by doing that, it's able to push the model and, and suggest the rest, which is private information. Now, there's a paper that came out to talk about how to start preventing this. Um, they very, very creative uh, ideas here where you basically automatically inject canaries. And when you do that injection of a canary, then you're able to detect later by probing on the first part of the canary and seeing if it predicts the, the latter half. Now, the bad news here is that it's only predicting or it's only detecting if you're already leaking. It is not preventing the leakage. That's still up to you and a sophisticated MLOps pipeline to detect to fail when you see leakage and to move forward. And there are we are getting better about this. There are things like differential privacy, which are gonna offer um, uh, ways to you know, further enclose the predictions. But uh, unfortunately, the reality is, is that some data will leak. And the reason it will leak is because if it's doing its job right, it sounds exactly like you. Uh, it, it suggests uh, routes that make sense to you. It suggests previous meetings that you went to. It suggests network graphs that feel like real human beings. Um, the problem is, is you're really gonna have to lock it down over time. But the number one thing you can do is build a pipeline that helps you understand exposure and react quickly. So that the moment you are able to detect that leakage, you stop it from going into production, you implement additional uh, tools to strip out that information, and, and it's appropriate. It is completely appropriate not to launch if you feel like, look, this just isn't something that we can defend against. So in summary, MLOps gives you a lot of solutions here around um, uh, building pipelines that you're gonna need no matter what. But especially, it gives you the ability to detect, to react quickly, and to build better models, especially from a security standpoint. Now, it's not free. There is some human and software work, but tools like uh, GitHub Actions and Kubeflow Pipelines and other tools of that kind are designed specifically to make it much, much easier than it ever has been before. And the reality is we really are gonna need to do this. Data science and machine learning models and everything like that will touch every person in this world in some way. I challenge you to open your, um, uh, your phone right now and look at any app that you have on your phone screen or your, um, your uh, home screen and, and show me that it doesn't use machine learning in some way. It's gonna to touch everything. But we can't ask the experts in those fields to go and, and understand all the complexities that I've laid out for you right here. What it's really gonna take is uh, smart people, is people watching this, the people normally I would say in this room, but you're obviously not in this room, um, to go and like understand this and empower them with the tools necessary to inform you and to work collaboratively around things like that. But the, the truths you cannot avoid, you will be attacked. Uh, the the uh, basics of security don't change just because it's ML. Your pipeline will have issues and the game is all about how quickly you can recover from those issues and mitigate the harms when you detect them. And as promised, as I said, uh, every paper that you see here um, uh, is listed below. Uh, you are more than welcome to uh, take your screenshots now. Uh, or if you'd like, you can just reach out. I, I'm always ready to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, uh, I truly believe that machine learning uh, will change the world, will make available and useful more data than we've ever had in the past. And it's up to us to empower people to go and use it. And with that, thank you very much.
Uh, hi, all. Uh, I think you can hear me. Um, uh, I'm uh, here to answer any questions you have. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, in the... Um, uh, sorry, I think I unmuted my phone. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the thread. Um, oh, sorry. Um, uh, do I think testing uh, for model robustness will be incorporated into ML operating, uh, uh, MLOps offerings, including Kubeflow? Yeah, um, uh, I can zoom back in slides, unfortunately. Uh, but right in the middle of the slides is where the um, uh, you'll see what I expect to see a very standard ML pipeline. So that's where you have um, uh, a, a series of very loosely coupled steps uh, driven via CI CD system like GitHub Actions. And um, in between that is where you'll add components that help you, um, uh, you know, do explainability, uh, look for security concerns, and things like that. Being able to build a very robust and flexible MLOps pipeline is critical um, and will make all the difference in your ability to adapt to situations like this. Um, moving down, uh, existing tool re related to ML SecOps. Um, honestly, your, your best bet is um, uh, first making sure that you have a great ML ops pipeline before you get any security involved. Um, uh, your ability to quickly observe things that are happening in production and, and retrain very, very quickly, that's going to be critical for any choice that you have. Outside of that, um, there are a number of different explainer models, and I think explain, uh, explanation uh, is probably your best bet to start. So whether or not it's like interpretability um, uh, ML from, from Azure, uh, IBM has a very uh, sophisticated responsible AI um, uh, toolkit, and then there are a number of like um, independent uh, uh, services that, um, or excuse me, uh, projects that take tackle these on one-off basis, uh, particularly around explainability, shop and Lime and things like that. You can see many of those uh, are called out in the papers that you see down below. Um, what you'll do is you'll take those and encapsulate them into your runtime, you know, whether or not it's a Kubeflow pipeline, uh, whether or not it's uh, a, you know, raw binary from a GitHub action, you throw it in a container, whatever it is, and then you add it to your overall pipeline. That will help you, but you need that pipeline in place first Otherwise, um, uh, you know, everything will be much more complicated. Uh, next question. If I had a number of cached predictions from an ML pipeline and I discovered malformed data from an attack, how would you reprocess those predictions uh, within the Kubeflow ecosystem? So again, you know, I, I know I sound like a broken record. The first thing is to have that pipeline. Um, it's incredibly important that you're able to declaratively kick off that retraining, even if it's just on the existing data. Um, that's going to be a good start. Um, uh, after that, um, what you want to do is, um, uh, you know, set up your detectors for that malformed data as it comes in uh, via an attack, um, and and make sure that you're getting the right signal to noise because uh, the difference between a you know a, a malformed data that that represents an attack and just malformed data because it's the internet or you know it's a huge data set or something like that can be very, very small. You're oftentimes going to run into uh, extremely high noise uh, signal to noise, or excuse me, extremely low signal to noise ratios. Uh, so making sure you have that, that tooling in place. Uh, but assuming that's all correct, your next step is to go back to your model, uh, look at your data processing and your feature engineering tools, make sure to exclude them or, or properly represent them so that you are able to um, uh, make sure to capture that as being bad results. Uh, the second thing that you can do certainly is uh, feed in those malformed data and label them. So as you bring in that malformed data, make sure it says, hey, this is bad. I'm going to give it a bad result. Uh, not not bad result, a null result, or, or say like I'm, uh, this is a, a negative uh, for whatever it was trying to detect for. So that's the second thing. Uh, and that's very, very powerful because that means for better or worse, it is much less likely that the same attack will work again because you've, you've now labeled it. Uh, the third, um, which is a very, very powerful technique, is uh, uh, doing doing things where it's, you're closer to doing restricted results, um, and things like one-hot training and things like that, where you don't uh, judge and give things a gradient, like this is you know 71% cat and 31% dog, 
Um, uh, I, I know those add up to 100%, but that's how a lot of these things work. It basically says uh, the, the accuracy that of, of that prediction being a cat or a dog. Um, and you could have, you know, whatever, 50% tiger or something like that, right? Like you'll have an entire array of them. Uh, instead of giving those uh, results back, you instead categorize them, forcibly categorize them into buckets, and then judge based on that and use that as your uh, success metric or your objective function or things like that. So that's another technique. Um, that's not always uh, possible. Uh, because if you look at things where you have generative language or you're you're responding on large corpuses of data, <clears throat> you may have uh, not you may not have the ability to kind of like arbitrarily swap swap things. But that would stop some of the attacks you saw there. Uh, there's no uh, chance something is, it, it makes it much less likely that a stop sign is now categorized as a, a speed limit fine. Um, but uh, you know all of those tools, um, you know they they really are no substitute for a very very efficient. Uh, pipeline where you're just continually retraining and that's really what Kubeflow uh, is designed to do and and in conjunction not just Kubeflow but all the other pipeline tools around it. Um, how does ML Ops compare to uh, continuous machine learning? I'll be honest I haven't dubbed uh, uh, dove do do deep on uh, continuous machine learning I'm not that familiar with it. Um, the, the tools think of Kubeflow and Kubeflow pipelines as an implementation of a general idea, which is, um, you know, largely why you're here, right? This is all about cloud native technologies and using them together. And, and the essence of building a sophisticated MLOps pipeline is having loose uh, services that are uh, coupled together, uh, microservice oriented, and making sure to have clean contracts between them. And by that, I mean, you finish your data processing, you uh, re release a set of metadata that says, these are the statistics for this. This is the number of features. This is the the uh, spread for each feature. Uh, for example, um, uh, one an example I like to give a lot. Um, you know, uh, if you had an age column, for example, you want to have a defined schema that says, "Hey, it is not allowed for an age to be larger than whatever 150 or less than zero. Uh, even you know that that since those are obviously nonsensical results, forcing your data into categories like that and having schemas." Will allow you to do unit testing and other things against that data, and and then you know obviously moving on all, all the way down the line. Uh, I haven't checked out continuous machine learning, um, uh, but you know a, a, anything that helps you build a a sophisticated loosely coupled pipeline like that, um, you know, is is a great first step. Do I foresee more regulations in the future around the use of ML models related to that GDBR and data itself? I do. Uh, unfortunately, I think that a, a lot of um, there's a lot of political energy and things like that um, that are focused really on the wrong thing. Um, a lot of this stuff right now is uh, unfortunately very uh, how do I say? It's it just the the words the, the things like responsible AI and ethical AI and things like that get a lot of attention and. Um, and rightly so, right? Uh, machine learning is a, a deep opportunity to like uh, ossify a lot of the biases that, that we've had for years and years, um, which is terrible, right? Um, but the reality is, is that your code was probably already doing this uh, ahead of time. Um, your, your code, your systems, everything like that was probably already biased. And um, that's not good, right? Like the problem is, is that with, with, uh, machine learning, you now have tools that will allow you to detect them more than ever, but, um, uh, you know, we don't have the tools in the past. And arguably, machine learning, you know, will make up a small percent of all applications. It, they'll be everywhere, but only a small percent. Um, so you're going to have a lot of focus on machine learning and ML and models and ethical AI and all that kind of good stuff. And, and that is a really big positive. But make no mistake that all that attention uh, really should be applied to the industry as a whole. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, people were uh, doing bias and racist and, and other things long before the advent of ML. And it's up to us as an industry to be responsive to that rather than just uh, do the focus on ML. Uh, but the direct answer is yes, I definitely think there will be um, uh, that kind of uh, uh, system uh, or th those kind of regulations in place. Um, continuing through... Um, how much uh, are these attacks mitigated using federated learning and other algorithmic privacy techniques? I noticed one paper mentioned federated learning. Look, uh, you know, 
Um, uh, if you look through here, there's a, a paper that shows how federated learning actually doesn't help. Uh, and in many, many ways, it makes it harder because now the central system can't look for specific violations. Uh, it can only look for um, uh, aggregated violations and things like that. And so you could actually have an attacker uh, submit bad data that the central system can't um, uh, uh, you know, detect, then push down that model everywhere and, and have um, uh, you know, an attack appear on everyone's phone simultaneously, which is obviously a nightmare scenario. Um, the reality is I don't think that, that these things, they, they help uh, for those that don't want large companies to um, see data, basically. Uh, and that's a very real concern, and I think privacy is very important for, from that perspective. Um, that said, um, uh, the, the, I, I think it, the, these techniques will help federated learning, differential privacy, other things, uh, uh, homomorphic encryption. These all will help in a variety of ways, um, but they should absolutely not be looked at as panaceas. Um, uh, without a pipeline and, and you actively working to detect, um, there is no way out. Uh, where do we go to learn about mitigating leaky data? Uh, there are a ton of papers out there on this stuff. Um, uh, you know, uh, my, my best advice for you is go and hire a red team. A red team is a, a team that goes and attacks your systems yourself. Uh, ML, and, and especially the generative ML leaks that you saw here, is a very, very small microcosm of data leaking generally. Um, uh, you know, almost every day, and, and by that I, I don't mean people going and hacking your S3 bucket and, and downloading a bunch of stuff. I mean, your system is operating exactly as intended, and yet still uh, you are leaking private corpus information out the side door. Um, there was an amazing um, uh, research project maybe about 10 years ago. Um, uh, AOL released a whole set of, of uh, web queries about uh, users. Uh, and they anonymized them. They they took all um, information off, uh, and yet uh, security researchers were able to go and and piece apart. Uh, they basically grouped the queries by individual, but they took out all the private information. Um, but security researchers were able to go and find a non insignificant number of people, like literally go and find their address, because they would say, "Oh, you know, uh, you know, dog walkers on the other Upper East Side," and uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, how to mount a satellite dish on a, you know, balcony or whatever, right? And, and piecing that together, uh, let them go and ultimately draw, you know, figure out exactly what this person was looking for. Uh, and that was years and years ago, that long before, you know, you saw a lot of the ML things here today. Um, basically, there's no uh, better tool than the human mind for going after this right now and going out and finding folks to think about all the private information you have and begin attacking it uh, yourself is an extremely powerful concept. Um, like I said during the talk, the biggest issue here is not um, unintentional leakage. The biggest issue is that if the system is doing the right job, it will leak um, uh, because it's supposed to leak, because it's supposed to sound like you, or it's supposed to give you very relevant information, or it's supposed to, um, you know, let you have access to, you know, an email you wrote seven years ago um, uh, in an elegant, elegantly presented way. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the, the uh, situation right now. Um, and, and, you know, the reality is, is that <clears throat> a lot of this comes down to a balance that we agree to as an industry, as a society, as all these things. Um, how do we lock that app down so that just you have access to it, or just you and your friends. But but as we release it to your friends, your friends, you have control over exactly what they can see and have real granularity and things like that. It's a very, very complicated topic. Um, the examples that I gave here are basically because it's, in ML in particular, I think it's easier to leak things um, than it is in a lot of other spaces because you have a large corpus of data that goes into a model and then is totally obfuscated. You have no idea what's going on. And then at the other end, you know, you get some results. Uh, and that can be really easy to like overlook. Um, some of the papers here give you a nice way to go and attack your own models and figure out exactly what you are leaking. Um, but again, there's no easy answer.
Uh, and with that, I think I am at time. All right. Well, uh, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it.